Yeah, this is a little thing right here. Right here. Yeah, let's just start right here. We don't know, what, is, what is this right here? Neck rod. Oh, right. Neck rod. Right. Now, what? How would it? How would you uh, increase the stroke? If you were going to increase the stroke by an engine, huh? Change the crank. The crank's the only way. You can do whatever you want to with that rod, but you're not going to increase the stroke. If you shorten the rod, you may put this. You may move the piston farther from the head, which is going to lower compression. If you make the rod longer, you're going to bang the head against there. All right. Now, on a on a diesel engine, on the average, how close does the piston come to the head on a diesel engine, Nick? Sorry. On a diesel engine, how close does it come? About. I, I put Nick down for a cell phone violation. What? Yeah. How close? Point zero zero five an inch. Point zero zero five. Well, what is that? How would you say that? Fifty thousand of an inch. Fifty thousand? That's not point zero zero five. That's five thousand. Well, All right. fifty thousand. No, it, it comes up to about 40 thousandths of an inch typically, but, but 40 thousandths, what it does when it gets hotter, it'll get really, really close because everything swells up a little bit, okay? All right, anyway, uh, now what, what's this down here for? About counterweight. Yeah, down basically it's basically, it wanted to run smoother and all that. Now one of the things I want to talk about, uh, the, uh, how many, uh, how many uh, degrees are there between the firing events on a four-cylinder engine? In other words, how many crankshaft degrees, how many degrees does the crankshaft turn between firing events on a four-cylinder? Nine. Nine. 180. Listen to that girl. She got it. She remembered, didn't you? So how did you know that? Did you just remember the number? Yeah. It's four into seven. It's on the thing. Yeah, it's on the thing. Oh, yeah, you, yeah, you were on the thing. Yeah. But it goes to 180. Yeah, you ran through the uh, elective thing, didn't you, that I built? Okay. So anyway, so here we got the, so it's a 180. What about a six-owner? 90. No. That's an eight. 120. 120, right? So you got that. All right, so there's the shaft. Anybody ever get the shaft? All right, there you go. This I'm is the block. On my this is the block. A whole for each piston, oil gallery, cooling system jacket, bearing saddles. Now, what do you call these things? Freeze blurry. Why do you call them that? Because they freeze, they pop out. That's not what they're there for, and it won't always. That's not 100. percent Every now and then you'll see the ice. Uh, and why does why does freezing make them pop out anyway? Because when water freezes, it expands. It does. How much? I just know it expands. Nine percent by volume. You gotta remember that. What what would happen if water didn't expand when it froze? We'll ice wouldn't blood. float. Ice wouldn't float and kill all the fish. Because it's sink to the bottom of the lake, right? <laughs> Got it? Anyway. So, okay, system jacket, bearing saddles for crankshaft and camshaft and block. Now, you see these big old holes right here where the coolant flows through? Yeah. Uh, are the holes in the gasket the same size as those holes? Should be, though. No, they're not. If they were, it would overheat. They're little tiny holes. Right? Little tiny holes in there. Okay, so those little tiny holes are there so that it'll have more time to gather the heat out of the head before it goes back. One time we were doing a, a job on a uh, bacteria net service bay where that envoy is. And um, the guy that was working on it was the guy that was from over in Elba. And he says, I don't like these head gaskets. He was pretty sharp, cookie. And I said, what's going on, Sean? He says, uh, the holes... And these, head, and these old head gaskets were really small where the water goes through. And on this one, they're cut the same size. And I said, do not put those head gaskets on that motor. And so it was Felpro gaskets. And so I called the parts store. He called Felpro. And they would, oh, no, don't do that, don't do that. We'll send you some new gaskets. Because <laughs> they were just, like, you know, it would burn the engine up. It would have been their fault. To see somebody that wasn't paying as much attention as he was would have put them on there with the same size holes that would have been ahead. And when the water goes through there too fast, okay, okay, it'll reach. What happens if you put 100% antifreeze in a coolant system? Seriously? It turns to jelly at 8 below zero. Doesn't work right. If you mix it with water, it does really well. But by itself, it ain't with a tooth. So you don't ever do that. Matter of fact, one manufacturer put, accidentally put pure antifreeze in a bunch of their truck engine and it, and it cracked heads and messed them all up. And they had to put a bunch of warranty repairs on there. 
bearing saddles for the crankshaft and the camshaft and the block. You see that? That's where the crankshaft goes. What do you call these? What goes in there? What, what, now? what goes in these holes right here? Crankshaft. Crankshaft goes in there. And what do you call these? These part right here that unbolts and lets the crankshaft come off? What do you call the bearings that go in there? Main bearing. Main bearing, <laughs> the main bearing cap, right? There you go. <coughs> yeah, we're trying to make sure everybody's on the same page. All right. Now then, what goes right here? Time and chain. Time and chain. Good folks. All right, pistons. Now, if you're going to rebuild an engine yourself, like if you're rebuilding your own engine, and this is a high mileage engine, the smartest thing you can do is bore it out 30 thousandths and put some new pistons in there. Because if you just go ahead and have it borne out 30,000 put new pistons in there, you know you got good round holes and there ain't no paper. I don't know how many times we rebuilt motors back in the day, back in the 70s, we just throw rings and bearings in there on, on faith. Oh, one, of my, one of my uncles started uh, telling back in the uh, thing said like the 50s or 60s, mm -hmm. they'll take a, when they rebuilt the motor, they put some tin cans. Yeah. They put tin cans at the cylinder. Yeah. Piston. Yeah, I've, I've heard of people doing that kind of thing. I had never. Tried that, I've, heard, I've heard people talking about it. Uh, anyway, all right, here's your camshaft. You got these egg shaped lobes. Open them out. Camshaft has a lot to do with how the engine breathes. I wanted to, uh, you need, when you pull it out, you got to get the lifters out of you pull it out. Now, a lot of the older lifters didn't have this wheel on the bottom, they were just flat. And it would ride directly on that camshaft lobe. But when you're pulling those flat bottom lifters out of there, what are you looking for on when you're rebuilding? Where? You want to see if it's dished. It ought to be perfectly flat. If it's got any dish in it, not only should you replace those lifters, you should also replace the camshaft. Now, occasionally, on those little flat bottom lifters, they would get beat out where they were a little bit too big to come out of the hole. How do you get them out of there? With a hammer. How are you going to hit them? You ain't going to the bottom. You're going to go in that little bore right there with a hammer? Unless you're a little bitty boy and you've got a great big hammer that you can swing. That ain't happening. You got there's a way to get out of there. What do you think, Nick? You gotta get those. You gotta get those lifters out of the holes in that block. Wait a minute. Now those holes right there. See them little holes right there? You gotta get them out. They won't come out this way. They gotta go back the other way. So how in the world are you gonna get? Huh? Here's what you do. You take your you 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 turn your camshaft until it's pushed all the lifters up out of the way, and then you pull the camshaft completely out. And then you put a, now I'm talking about with a motor in a truck, right? And then you take a, a antifreeze jug or a piece of plastic like that and shove it in there so you can push those lifters out the other way and that jug will pop and then they'll be laying in there and you just pull them out that way and then you put new lifters in there. That's a little trick you can, yeah, you know, I'm sure you can make an extra for that. Push rods, what do you know about push rods? They help deliver oil and push the They don't all help deliver oil, some of them are solid. Now on that 3.1 in that car that you just working on, the push rods are two different lengths. They're the, they're every other one is a half inch shorter on that one. So you got to be paying attention when you pull them out of there so you'll know how they go back. Right? For you. What causes dead lifters? Dead lifters? You mean, you mean where, they're, where they won't pump up? Yeah, you can just take the push rod and just punch down. Punch they're, they're, they're leaking internally. You know, they're basically worn out on the inside where they're usually have a channel worn out in there where oil can just get by them instead of getting, you know, cushioned. So the, the hydraulic lifters, what they do is they keep the valves adjusted automatically. And on that Chevrolet engine over there, you've got to adjust the valves by tightening those rocker arm nuts down to where you're putting that thing in that range, you know, and there's actually a way to do that. On a lot of the engines, though, uh, you just tighten the rocker arm assemblies down and everything like it ought to be, but on that Chevy, you got to adjust it. On the Phase 6 Ford, you got to adjust them. Most of them, you don't have to adjust them. Though. On Hondas, you actually have to adjust them with a screwdriver and a wrench and a feeler gauge. And on Hondas, what happens? The valves get a little too tight because they wear into the, you know, valve wears into the seat, they get too tight, then you wind up with the valves not seating well, and you wind up with rough idle issues and misfire codes and all kinds of stuff like that. So if you get a Honda that's giving you misfire codes and a little bit of rough idle and maybe some fuel trim issues and nothing seems to make any sense, why don't you go ahead and adjust the valves? It only makes sense because that's, that's what they need a lot of them. And it's not that difficult to do, but you kind of got to know, you always got to have that load up when you're adjusting around, okay? All right, there's your base circle and your load lift. Well, like I was telling you all the other day, if you take a, a mic, now you said dial indicator, that was a good answer in a way, but if you got a camshaft laying on the table, you can't do much with a dial indicator, can you? 
if it's in the motor you can, but you measure from here to here with your bike, and then you measure from there to there, that's going to give you lift. What's the other consideration on camshafts, lift and what? There's two different things that you're concerned about on a camshaft. Duration. Lift and, huh? Duration. duration. He said duration. So you got that? Lift and duration. Duration is how fat this is. That's how long it keeps the valve open. Okay. All right. So now here's the, how the eggs line up. Let me ask you this. What is this overlap for? We've talked about this before. You're better remember remembering it. What? Overlap. What's that overlap for? Why do they overlap those? Why do they have that overlap? There's your exhaust lobe center line and your intake lobe center line and your lobe separation angle. Well, what the heck is this overlap about? What does that actually do? What do we tell you about your intake, compression, power, and exhaust? What's going on when the piston gets to the top of the exhaust stroke? What's going on? No, the no. exhaust valve hasn't quite closed yet when the intake valve begins to open. So there is a brief period of time when the intake and the exhaust valve are open at the same time. And why does it do that? Because you're wanting that incoming mix to purge the exhaust, make sure that it's got a perfectly clean mix. Because if you don't, you're going to have a rough idle and it's going to, you know, run like, it's going to sound like a daggum two cycle engine idle. Blah, 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 you know. Uh, all right, valve timing, belt or chain? What's better? Is the chain better than belt? Yes. Yeah. I would say so because I don't know. Well, now the chains still fail and they still have to be changed. But would you rather change a chain or a belt? I rather change a chain. Belt's gonna be easier to change. But... Now, if the vehicle is a free spinning engine, that means. The timing belt on that uh, Toyota engine out there that we fool around with all the time, if it's out of time, the valves and the pistons don't ever meet each other. On every timing chain engine I've ever known anything about, if the timing, if the, if the cam and the crank gets out of line, valves and pistons come into contact, and they just beat the crap out of each other. Kias are do that, are horrible to do that. You know, if, the, if it jumps time, you're supposed to be changing a, a, the thing at 100 and I think 102,000 or something like that. And if you go to 108,000, they're probably going to jump down and going to destroy the motor. And with some little four-wheel Kias. Uh, the early Ford Escorts, really, really early Ford Escorts, the first ones to come out, they would bend, they would, uh, bend valves and stuff when they jumped down. Then they fixed them where they wouldn't. Well, they thought that was a bad idea. But a lot of them, Mitsubishi, if a Mitsubishi jumps time, you're going to have bent valves. Now, if the Kia jumps time, it's going to snap the head off the valve and beat the crud out of the piston and you can put a motor in that one. You know, but, uh, but you can take a little valve job on the... Uh, on the uh, Mitsubishi's. And the Mitsubishi's a lot of times have the motor in there backwards. It means the timing belt will be on the driver's side. Which means the engine runs Time the opposite direction. Yeah. Always runs the way the button the car rolls. Alright, heads and valves. Now, another thing, let me back up for a second. These laminated uh, timing chains, like that you see right there, they're quiet, but they like to stretch. One time there was this boy that had this uh, uh, 390 in you know, a Ford XL 69 model, and I was going to get this motor to build it and put it in a guy's truck, upgrade him to a, from a 360 to a 390, and uh, and he, I cranked it up in there under his little carport thing, boom, 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 you know, he's going to get rid of the car, and so I took the, uh, uh, I revved it up, boom, 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 and then I took, when I took the timing cover off, that timing chain was so loose you could take it off with your fingers without taking any of the gears off. <laughs> it was amazing to me, it didn't jump time to destroy everything, because they had nylon gears I mean, they had a, aluminum gears with nylon teeth on them. And a lot of times they'd come off, they'd get down there, they'd get up an oil pump, lock it up, and cause, you know, things to happen. Now, heads and valve, that's a free valve engine right there. The heads need cooling more than any other part of the engine. The head's the hottest part. That's why, on a lot of vehicles nowadays, they don't have a regular engine coolant temperature sensor. They have, a, they have cylinder head temperature sensors in both heads. Okay? So, one of the cool things about having your spark cop coil spark is if one particular cylinder is actually pinging, ping, 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 it can detect which cylinder is pinging and it can turn off the spark or retard, not turn off the spark, but it retards the timing on that one cylinder. So it can change the ignition timer from cylinder to cylinder based on any pinging that it hears. 
pinging, meaning you know your labor's not going off. You've heard that one sound when it starts to overheat. You know, you sound like somebody's got marbles bouncing around in there. La, la, la. I mean, it's just rattling. It makes a terrible rattling noise, and that's the detonation thing. Whenever the flame, whenever the piston's coming up, it's so hot in there it lights off before the spark plug fires. That's what's going on there. That can be happening because of uh, advanced ignition timing too far or an engine that's running too hot or compression that's too high because it's got carbon build up on the heads and it's taking up room in the combustion chamber, that kind of thing. Alright, okay, so you're all about building an old school V8, right? Yeah. Let's see if we can build an old school V8. Alright, there's your block. Now what are we doing here? We're putting the crankshaft in it. Yeah, We're putting sure. on the end cap. That's a four bolt main. All right, we're going to do that. Put that on there. Now it turns through. When you're building an engine, you're, it's really important. They do this at the factory. When you're putting that thing together, every time you tighten something else that's on that rotating assembly, you're going to check the turning torque to make sure that it doesn't get too tight. If all of a sudden it gets too tight to turn, you need to back up and find out what you did wrong. And this is actually going pretty slow, but that's the timing cover. It's an old 350. And there's the oil pan. There's the oil filter. We put that on there a little early. And by, and the, this is what the how the valves and the push rods and the springs look like. And the big ones are the intake valve, the small ones are the exhaust valve. And there's your thermostat housing, fuel rail, plenum chamber, and your intake. And there's your throttle plate. Yay, there you go. There's the balancer, there's the water pump. And we got no, I don't see a camshaft in there, y'all. Looks like they left it out. Somebody did a bad job on that thing. No, they put a camshaft in Yeah. Yeah. It looked like an empty hole when I looked at it a second ago. And there's your front end accessory drive. Headers. Once again, why are headers better than old cast iron exhaust? Yeah, because you don't get the back pressure. It actually is extracting the exhaust because of the way those collectors are set up. All right. Now, we think going to do this faster. Let's see if we can do this quicker. We can't do it quicker. I think I've already shown you all this anyway. All right. Now, compression, fuel, and ignition. All you've got to remember this, that an engine is running right, is well all carefully orchestrated machine. Breathes, breathes in the air, compresses, make lights off the mix. You can see it happening out there. The oxygen, the hydrocarbons, create superheat. And what is it that's expanding to push the piston down when the combustion event happens? What's what gas? Is that yeah, what's expanding it pushes a piston down? Nitrogen. nitrogen. Because the air that we're breathing is 78% nitrogen, and so you're superheating that nitrogen whenever that combustion event happens, and it's the expanding nitrogen that pushes the piston down. Probably never heard that before, did you? The nitrogen's what does it? Bernie Thompson calls that the working fluid which is pretty cool, I think. Anyway, generally over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, whenever that thing is firing, it's going to have that. All right, when an engine starts, the injectors double pulse to wet the manifold and the spark is happening barely before top dead center. Uh, before top dead center is optimum, if you're just ribbing the engine up, you might notice that the spark happens sooner and sooner because the fuel only burns so fast. So your spark has to happen sooner, so it'll have time to burn and get the maximum amount of power out of that push. Now, gasoline direct injected engines not only can control when the fuel is injected, they can control how it's injected, which is pretty cool. That's why you got a little 1.6 liter GDI engine pulling this big van or something, you know, because they got more power the way they're set up. That's another deal. Uh, but anyway, there's a little degree wheel there. Uh, top dead center. Everybody knows what top dead center is. Do you know what top dead center is? That's when the crankshaft's in the center, piston size is going to go. How do you find top dead center? Like if I told you to find top dead center, I'm sort of number three on this one. How do you find it? Turns it all in. Well, wait a minute. How are you going to know that you're only exhausting the part takes from? What's fire order on this one? You remember? 14, 45, 36? All right. We'll talk about that again in a minute. All right. Okay, after it starts at a low load idle, the ignition spark time and notice around 10 to 15 degrees before top dead center, and the engine speed increases, so does the timing because fuel only burns so fast that so the spark has to happen sooner. You got it? Alright, when you're accelerating or pulling hard, the timing retards a little bit to prevent detonation. 
the detonation is basically whenever the uh, pressure increases in there and you don't want it lighting off early and causing the pistons to ring like a bell. That's where you get your pinion noise. Oh, I thought you remember this thing. There was a uh, there was a movie one time called Don't Tell Her It's Me. It had Steve Gutenberg and some little gal on it. And she drove out there to this two-story house looking for him at an old Buick or something she was driving, a big old long thing. And when she switched it off, you ever heard a car diesel when you switch it off? You switch it off and it keeps running. You know what? It quits running because of the heat. It keeps lighting off the mix. In spite of the fact you turn off the ignition, it keeps having combustion events and it keeps doing it enough to where it'll run for a little while before it shuts off sometimes. And I don't know how they did that for the movie. It's funny as all get out. But she got out and went in that house and went all the way up to the upstairs looking for that guy. And when she came back down, that car was still sitting there going, still dieseling. And she just turned the key back on it. It was running again and she drove off. So I would find that old video somewhere. It's funny to me. But anyway, knowing the firing order is important. Now, if you know the firing order, you can figure out the companion cylinder by drawing an imaginary distributor. Right that, you see that? You gotta know which way to turn. If the firing order is 18726543, 18726543, if you draw an imaginary distributor, eight and five will be companions, one and six will be companions, four and seven will be companions, and three and two. Why is it important to know what the companion cylinders are? Yeah, and also, what else is going on with the companions? If it's got core packs, both those are spark plugs are popping at the same time, even though one of them is compression and the other is off. All right. So you can also figure out the companion cylinders by driving the dividing the firing order in half. Right? Like that one six. <laughs> you know, like that right there. Uh, that's not too much of a big deal. What's that firing order that I just showed you, by the way? You recognize the firing order? What engine it was for? What was it? Remember what the firing order was? Can anybody set, repeat that back to me? Which one? That one that I showed you. 187, uh, 18, 72, 65. That's a 350. Come on. Come on. Uh, no, it's not 353. 43. Yeah. I think that's a 5.3, which is different from a 350. You'd think it'd be the same, wouldn't you? But they're not. It's still a 350. No, well, that's well, a 327 if it's 5.3. How many cubic how many cubic inches per liter? Sixty. A three fifty is what in liters? A five three? Five yeah, no, a three fifty. Oh, wow. It's what in liters? Wow. You know what a five three is in liters, don't no. I mean it's gonna be divided by sixty one. Five point seven. Oh yeah. You knew that. Yeah. You knew it. You just weren't thinking. Everybody just zoned out on me. What's up with that? All right. Here's the seal chamber. A lot of compression can be determined by setting the suspect cylinder on TDC compression stroke. Uh, both valves closed, compressed piston at top crank center, and introducing air into the spark loss of compression. Uh, so if you put air in that spark plug hole at the top, this is where the air is escaping. Intake, it'd be an intake valve. Exhaust, exhaust valve. Crank case, piston, the ring, bubbles in the radiator, head gasket, adjacent cylinder head gasket. Now, we can find out on that one which cylinder is pushing air into the intake. Can't we? How do you do it? Without pulling the motor out. The tool you gotta put up to? No. You pull all the plugs out but one. Fill the radiator up. Spin it over, see if it disturbs the water. Move that plug to the next hole, spin it over, see if it disturbs the water. When you find the one that makes bubbles and makes the water jump, that's the cylinder that's pushing compression into the equipment. We had a three liter torque below compression on cylinder number one. Pull all the spark plugs, got the cylinder number one on TDC compression by making sure its companion was on exhaust. So if you can find exhaust on one, you know that the other one should be on compression, right? We injected smoke into the number one spark plug hole and it came out the number three hole. What did it mean? We put smoke in the number one hole, it came out the number three hole. That told us what was wrong. What was wrong? Very fire order, 142536. An engine like this one here. What do you have to do in order to figure out why smoke is coming out the number three hole if you put, if you put it if you shoved it into number one? <laughs> you got to know the firing order, and you got to understand how the engine works to begin with, and which valves are open, and which pistons are coming up, and all that kind of stuff. All right. What stroke number three is on when number one is a TDC compression? So you got to think deeper than most people are willing to to do stuff like this. So what cylinder? See, this is compression. And firing again. It's one, four, two, five, three, six. 
three is coming up on exhaust. Right? So the exhaust valve on three is open. So if you're putting this in there and both valves are supposed to be closed, the smoke's coming out over here, that means the exhaust valve's letting the smoke. Right? You got it out? And it's going through the manifold now. So there you go. Three is it PDC compression right there. Three is it BDC firing. And exhaust. See, there's your degrees of crank, I mean, of uh, rotation. All right? We determined that the number three exhaust valve was open, so the exhaust valve was compromised on number one. Customer crashes his CRX, buys a good oh, CRX with a bad okay. engine. And our task is to take the good engine and put it in the bad car. That was simple enough, didn't it? All right, so the 88 CRX, we decided to check the bad engine. No, no compression on cylinder number four. No compression at all on cylinder number four. So then I says, well, let's go ahead and, and find out where it's going. So we put it, get a, uh, we put the, uh, the uh, cylinder leakage tester in cylinder number four, and we had no compression, but we had no cylinder leakage either. How's that possible? Tim usually has the answer. What do you think, Tim? No compression, but no cylinder leakage. No, that would have let the cylinder would leak past the rings. The guy was revving it up, was, was winding it up so tight that it threw a rod, and then the crankshaft came around and busted that piece of rod off and knocked it out there, and the piston was standing at the bottom of the hole. The piston wasn't moving, but everything was sealed up real good. Huh? All right. So, two engines had two different kinds of fuel injection. The good car had TBI, the crash car had MFI. What's the best way to handle this? Look at that. Change intake. Look at that. You got, a, uh, you got that, you got that. This is 1.5, it's 1.6. This is the one that was in the car that he crashed. This is the one that was in the car that was a bad engine that we were needing to put this engine in there. Now you, you're pretty smart because what we did was we broke this thing down. We took the intake and the exhaust, laid them back, turned that motor into a long block, dropped it in there, bolted up the exhaust and the intake, and we were good to go. Some of the guys in here were saying, well, we got to change out the wire harnesses and all of these fuel components. <laughs> that was the silliest thing I ever heard, right? Okay, short block versus long block. Know the difference. Short block. It's got pistons. It's got the crankshaft. Long block. It's got the head. See that? The head. If you've got a few of them time belts on like that. Sometimes a long block on a Chevy, or engine on these V8s, will have valve covers. They won't have an oil pan, but they'll have valve covers on it. They were thinking, they used to call them Target Master engine when the Chevrolet people did. But this one guy that was a floor sweeper or something over at Ford Places out there, and me and one of the truck mechanics were standing outside the parts room talking for a minute about something. And he came out of there and he goes, I was going to buy an engine from my wife's van, so they're asking me a question I don't know. Uh -huh. And I said, uh, what do you need to know, John? He says, well, can you come out here and look at my wife's van and tell me if it's got a short block or a long block in it? <laughs> I heard that and, before. And I told the... Uh, uh, the truck mechanic with me and said, I'm going to let you handle this one. Alright, so that's the V8. Short and long box. Long, short block, long box. That's the end of the show. Alright, now if I give you a pop test on this, you going to be able to pass it? Well, let's see. Let's Y'all weren't zoned out and trying to sleep, were you? Alright. Right. That's a little engine thing. Did you learn something you didn't know before you came in here? That's what I always ask every time I get through one of these. Is there anything you know that you didn't know when you sat down? Or did you already know everything that I said and that was just boring you to tears? What do you think? I just need to make right now. Kudos to her for knowing the 180 thing, right? On the electrode, I was asking about the two-piece piston. Mm -hmm. That's what I didn't understand. It was asking, like, what you should know, like, what you should have put on first. Something like if you don't have to have, like, a ring or something. I'm going to I'm going to see that question because I'm more confused now than I was when I came in here. <laughs> <laughs>